You are listening to a Pod Bros exclusive. Okay, guys, we're live. Brand new episode, Take Aim Outdoor Podcast, and I am uh, super excited for today's show. We're going to do a little talk about a do-it-yourself elk hunt, a do-it-yourself kind of in general for guys of us on this side of the, let's say, the Mississippi, and uh, kind of just going to take a few minutes to debunk those myths or those fears of the intimidation. But uh, back with me again today is my good buddy Brian Broderick from Lost Arrow Films. How you doing, Brian? Good, man. How about you, Brandon? Good, man. I got uh, happy St. Patty's Day, by the way, but I got to uh, go out and shed hunt this morning for an hour, hour and a half, and uh, it was it's kind of chilly here, 41 degrees, but had a good time. I found one dead one but, and uh, no sheds, though. So, But it was nice just to get out and kind of, you know, get some exercise and some fresh air. Heard heard turkeys gobbling like crazy this morning so that got me fired up yeah they uh the turkeys are definitely gobbling and um you know i i talk to you a lot about what you're up to and and you talk about shed hunting and and i i guess it is just a western thing or midwestern thing um nobody in the south shed hunts and um uh it just it blows me away the the you know the the interest that people have in that and maybe it's just all the snakes we have nobody wants to get out when it's green I don't know <laughs> so that could but, be uh, yeah. let's talk about that for one second Brian do you guys yeah. I mean do you have the amount of you know like squirrels brown squirrels and stuff rodents that we had that chew up antlers so fast is that one reason maybe you guys don't do it. Uh, we have lots of squirrels, lots of rodents. Yeah, they they work on the antlers pretty, pretty, pretty good. You know what though, man? I, you know, I've talked to you the last couple of weeks, and you know, you've gotten out and found a shed or two. And you know, I would tell you if you want to find sheds, just come down here and get on one of my tractors, and in 15 minutes you'll have one stuck in a tire. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's that's how I find them is I get on the tractor and start getting the soybean fields ready and I end up bringing a dozen back to the barn. So, um, but you know, it's, uh, it's just something that we just don't really uh, get into down here. I don't know why. Maybe one, uh, spring like this, we'll, uh, double up a turkey hunt and a shed hunt. We'll do like a Kansas or somewhere like that where, you know, you'll kind of get really to grasp of why guys shed hunt. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I got you. I, I guess I run so many, I run so many cameras that, um, uh, you know, I kind of know what I've got before season, during season, and after season. And I think it's a very effective scouting tool, you know, for knowing, you know, which bucks made it. But I, I think I'm probably accomplishing the same thing with cameras maybe, you know. Sure. Yeah, well, I believe you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally do. So, well, I know we're uh, going to talk about uh, kind of, like I said, just debunking the myths of, uh, you know, planning a do-it-yourself hunt out west, which is, you know, by any means, it can be intimidating and fearful, and it just seems like a big cast. And, Brian, I know you've been doing it for years, so give me a little uh, rundown on how to get started and how to kind of ease that mental fear that uh, some guys have okay well um you know uh i think we're we're probably um probably doing some brown great groundbreaking uh uh podcast history here because i don't know that anybody's ever asked a guy from alabama how to how to do a do-it-yourself uh elk hunt out west <laughs> so, never, uh, never 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 happened no no, no. So everybody's going to say, why in the world are you asking this hillbilly how to do it? So um, I'll just tell you, you know, uh, uh, I, I missed my first week uh, of my senior year in high school uh, to go on a bear hunt. And um, and I, I just wanted to travel and hunt 
and experience other locations and, and uh, other types of, of hunting of animals, uh, I just had such desire to do it from such a young age that I would do just about anything. And, and um, so I missed my first week of high school uh, to go on a bear hunt, and um, I did whatever it took, you know, bartered with my parents, bartered with my principal, bartered with my coaches um, to make it happen. And um, uh, then I worked at a, a hunting and fishing store uh, on the weekends and um, during the summers. And a couple of the guys that worked there, you know, were going to allow me to go with them. And so I, I did. And that was my first trip out of the state hunting. And it just, it really, I really got the bug. And just a side note on that, we drove from Alabama to, from lower Alabama to uh, New Brunswick, Canada to bear hunt. And uh, I went with two guys that smoked and both had severe stutters. So it was a 30 hour drive there one way. And I tell you, I, I, um, that just goes to show y'all do anything to go hunt. So (laughs) You couldn't um, wait to get out of that car, could you? Oh my gosh, it was it was horrible. So anyway, um, after that, uh, a, a guy at my church that that um, is so instrumental in me becoming a a, a successful outdoorsman uh, asked me to go elk hunting with him in New Mexico. He had never done it. I had never done it. I was a 19 year old kid, and. Uh, he, this guy taught me how to trap, um, how to bow hunt, everything. And um, and so I, I went with him, and we planned the hunt. And this is before the days of of, um, of GPSs, before the days of the Internet and Google Earth. And so basically you got a Forest Service map and your BLM maps and your topo maps from the you know USGS service, and that was it. And that's what you had to do your research with. Those were your resources. And then you would stay on the phone, um, you know, with Game and Fish and try to get a, you know, a biologist biologist to talk to you uh, and tell you the truth, which was tough. But that was really all you had back then. So we did it. We did our research. Uh, We went into the draw in New Mexico. We got drawn for a unit that that, uh, the biologist told us was a good unit. And, and off we went. And, um, again, I'm a glutton for punishment. We drove 30 hours again. Uh, I had a really nice new truck. He didn't want to pay for the fuel in my nice new truck. He had a 1979 regular cab, two-wheel drive, Toyota truck, four-speed, and no air conditioning. And we drove out there in that truck to save gas. <laughs> so, Oh, uh, it was horrible. It was absolutely oh, yeah. horrible. I mean, the truck wouldn't even go up the hill. So anyway, that was my first foray into hunting out west, and it just bit me, it bit me hard, Brandon. And and I've been going ever since. And it was 24 years ago. So what I'm going to tell you is, is that these are the things I'm going to tell you about doing it. I've been doing it for 24 years. Uh, been pretty successful. I've only done archery. So I can't really speak to the the gun hunting out there, but I can tell you about archery. So in that time, I've hunted different states, um, different areas, and I'm going to give you my my basic 101 strategy if you just want to go and have a quality elk hunt. Um, The first thing is finding the location. So you've got different states that draw, of course. Some have bonus points, and these things can get very confusing and convoluted. I stay away from the states with bonus points and all that jazz. You're never going to go elk hunting if you're trying to draw these primo states, primo units in those states with all these points. It doesn't make sense to me. And there's so many areas that you can buy over the counter that have super quality hunting. And by quality hunting, what I mean is, is you have interaction with elk on a daily basis, and you have uh, opportunities at five by five, six by six bulls, um, you know, nice, nice animals 
but, you know, not world-class animals. Um, there are also states that are just strictly draw, but they don't have a point system. And that's what I, that is my strategy, and that's what I do. I always, draw, I always try to draw New Mexico units first, and let me expand on that a little bit. There's not a unit in New Mexico that you can't have a quality elk hunt in. And that is, that is a bold statement, but it is true. There is not a bad unit in New Mexico. But what there is is there's units in New Mexico that may be wilderness area, that are physically challenging, that you can't do on your own without the help of a packer or unless you're in, you know, Cameron Haynes, Aaron Snyder type physical condition, which most of us you are. Do. I like I like donuts. So, Brian, just to touch on your point for one yeah. second, I'm going to tell the listeners that I just heard some of the data from New Mexico's elk hunt, ironically, of 2015 season, and they're, one of their just so-so zones that they – don't harvest a lot of big bulls and the uh, the archery tag percentages was extremely low in this unit, but the average bull was like a 330. And the conversation basically was just about any time in New Mexico, like you were saying, you will have a really good hunt. But any time in almost any unit in New Mexico, a giant bull can appear. And in this unit that's not known for this, they shot a 430-inch bull. So just to prove yep. Brian's point, it, it's one of those states that you just never know. Yep, and they killed that bull down south. Um, yeah, they did. Which, yep, and I know where it, I know the unit it came out of. Uh, I've hunted it. Um, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that a bull would come out of there. But, you know, there's really... The, the thing I like about New Mexico is, is I'm from Alabama, and when I go out west, it's like I'm breathing through a coffee straw. So there's no amount of, amount of physical conditioning that I can do to combat the elevation change. I live on the water, on the Mobile Bay. I live at, you know, one foot above sea level. So when you put me in eight, nine, ten thousand feet, the, the, the adjustment for my body is is going to be a lot longer than a guy that, that says live that say lives out west and is doing it on his own, but he lives at four or five thousand feet. So, you know, there's a huge difference there. So, I stay I try to stay south as far as I can. I try to pick units that are not as physically challenging. I don't care as much about distance as I do about topography. So. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for units that don't have huge elevation climbs and drops. You know, uh, I'm looking for those elevations that, that, that are, you know, four to 500 feet on average as your change. Those are things that I can handle. I can handle quickly. I can acclimate quickly, and I can cover a lot of ground. So New Mexico, there's a lot of areas in New Mexico that has that type of topography. There's other states that do as well, but those are the states that it's impossible to draw. I want to go elk hunting every year. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put in all this money to get one tag every 10 years, say, in Arizona. And let me tell you, those great high-quality tags that everybody wants, some of these tags that there's only four for a non-resident in the unit, guess what? you still got to go hunt. They're not just standing out there in a pasture when you get there. You still have to figure out that unit and go hunt. So I just kind of push all that to the side. I go to states that don't have the point system that you have just as good a chance as every other non-resident that apply. So that's my first run is New Mexico. After that, if I don't draw, which I normally don't, I go to Colorado or Idaho. And those air, those two states have incredible over-the-counter opportunities. Now, there's other states that have this, too. These are the two states I've spent the most time hunting. So when you go to these over-the-counter the, over the areas, there's so much public land, it's overwhelming. You don't know where to start. So you have to do the research and find the biologists that will talk to you, talk to you about elk densities, 
look at the success ratios. If you see a 10% success ratio, that's a great unit. I want people to understand that if you're not looking for this 40, 50% success rate. It doesn't exist in public land hunting. So you see something in that 10% range, that's kind of where you want to hunt. So the other thing that I do is, is I try to stay away from these big wilderness areas. That's where the guys that really hunt hard and really get after it, that's where they go in there and spend their time. And you can invest a lot of energy, a lot of pain, a lot of sweat, a lot of blood, packing in these wilderness areas to a remote area that you can, you know, determine have some should have some elk there. You could get all the way in there and somebody already be there. So when you're coming from out of state, you can't really pigeonhole yourself to one plant. You've got to be fluid. So the areas I look for in these over-the-counter areas are these units that have long access points. Let's say that, that there's, a, there's a, 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 you know, a highway or a county road that runs 10 or 15 miles up this unit, and you have to pack in through different access points maybe a mile or two. By having a location like that or a unit like that, now you've got the opportunity to move and be flexible. You go in, you pack into an area for a day or two, animals aren't there, you're not seeing fresh sign, don't stay there. You have to pick up and move. And if you're hunting these wilderness areas, physically you almost just can't do it. So I try to stay away from those and try to hunt these areas that are intermingled with private land, private ranches, your BLM maps will show you all that. You're looking for, for BLM land or, or state land or you're looking for federal land that touches public roads or public accesses that you can get in. And once you go and do it once, you're going to be 90% ahead of the game. And then you've just got to come that other 10% to start being proficient. Um, so, so Brian, I know it seems overwhelming, but it's not. What's that? So I'm just teasing for a second the image that's out there. And a lot of the image that's out there is you got to be, and I'm not poking fun in Cam Haynes, but the idea of having to jog in seven miles to a wilderness area just to elk hunt. So you're kind of debunking that, saying that you're gonna, you've been able to find a niche, and that niche is, you know, two miles, three miles from an area that you're camped at or staying at? I, I, I'll give you one quick example. Uh, there's an area in Colorado that I've hunted uh, twice. Um, probably will go back this year and probably take you in there this year. Um, I can't wait. That a, mi a mile and a half from where we parked the vehicle, um, I killed a bull the second afternoon and my partner killed a bull the, set, the third morning, and we were packed out. We went to it, went to the lo to the local processor in the nearest town, got a hotel room, gave him a couple of hundred bucks, a bottle of Crown, and asked him to work late. And he processed our elk for him for us. We loaded them up and drove back home to Alabama, and we came home uh, I think four or five days early. So, and that was within That's a mile and a half of our bid. Well, maybe so, but I, I guess it, it, it can be done. Um, and here's what I would say. The first time out for anybody, go as late in the archery season as you can go. The elk are more vocal. They're not going to come charging into calls most of the time, like they do on television. But they're going to be vocal, and you're going to know whether you're in the right area or not. You're going to be able to move to animals and then start figuring out how to hunt elk. If you go through public land, certain public land, especially over-the-counter units, and stay on that call all day, your odds of, uh, my odds of success doing that were not very high. Um, what I do is, is I get vantage points, not so much as I can see. Everybody is caught up in this glassing, super glassing 
you know, type of hunting, that is very, very effective only in certain areas. If you're getting up to the highest elevation for a vantage point and you can only see a half a mile around you, you're spinning your wheels. The only, you're not, you know, you definitely want to get up there and look, but what you're wanting to do is you want to get up there and listen. The other thing I do, and this is kind of my key to success, is I cover a lot of ground at night. I will walk miles in the pitch black dark at night listening for bulls, listening for bugles, because they're way more active in the dark. When I'm hunting New Mexico or certain parts of Colorado, certain parts of Idaho, I'll actually stay in my truck all night long, guzzling Red Bulls and eating honey buns to stay awake, and go from spot to spot to spot in the truck listening. When everybody else is asleep, I'm out there listening. I'm listening for bulls bugling. And that's how you find where they are. And once you find the area that has a concentration of elk, then you can begin to hunt. What I do is, number one, when I'm scouting a new area, is water, water, water. That's what I'm looking for. They have to have it. So you've got to identify water. If you buy the more detailed topo maps of the area you want to hunt, you know, I think it's the 1 in 15,000 scale maps. It's the real tight ones. Um, They'll show you springs. They'll have they'll have spring uh, symbols on them. Those spring locations, if you go from the spring to spring to spring to spring to spring, eventually you're going to find a wallow, a water hole, something that has, if there's elk there, they're utilizing it. And that's how you can start. And that's, that's the best advice I can give anyone is how to start. Um, so once you get in the air and you find elk, what I do is, is I try to figure where they're going in the mornings to bed and where and, and, and they're, are they coming out the same way. Once I do that, I'm working wind, I'm working wind, I'm working wind. <laughs> that is it. If you're, if you're set up and you know the wind is wrong, they're never going to get near you, you're never going to see them, you're never going to hear them. The tricky things for us as flatlanders is thermals. It's totally different out there than what it is here. When we have a northwest wind, we have a northwest wind. We do mess around with thermals a little bit as tree stand hunters, but and it allows you to cheat the wind maybe a little, but out there, you may be in a creek bottom and the wind may be flowing down the drainage. You may get, say, 100 yards up the side of one of those drainages and the wind can be doing the exact opposite based on the thermals. So you have got to be checking wind constantly, 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 and and checking it on the levels that you're trying to hunt these animals. That is probably the toughest thing I had to overcome out there. So I think that's one of the things that people should really try to educate themselves on. And there's plenty of information out there on the basics, but you've just got to get out there and do it, you know? Absolutely, and I just want to hit on that for people that don't know exactly what Brian means with scent and thermals. With the rise of a temperature, it changes the way the scent pattern goes, and with the descent of a temperature, it changes the way the scent goes as well. So thermals are it's a big deal. Heavy, it's, yeah, it's heavy air and cold air. Right. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 heavy air is 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 cold air, and hot air is light air. It's an easy you know, basic dumbed down way to, to you know, to, to discuss it. I mean it's it's confusing as hell for me, but once you kinda of figure out that you just gotta stay on your wind checker, know what those thermals are gonna do during certain times of day, you figure it out pretty quick. And there's also places that you'll find that are really cool, uh, that the wind stays pretty steady in those are the areas that I like to kind of stay. If I'm gonna do a setup and try to ambush that's kind of where I want to set up is where the wind is more predictable and stable and you can stay there long. Yeah, absolutely. And another good point is I know you mentioned water, Brian. For the listeners, again, elk have to, have to. It's a must. They must visit water once a day. So that's why it's such a great point that 
Brian, you know, gave that information because once you find that spot that elk are coming and going and they have a water hole that they feel safe at, somewhere between A and B, you have a good chance as a hunter or bull hunter to find those elk, like Brian said. Yeah, it's it's all about water on your on your due diligence. When you're doing your due diligence to, set the, to determine where you're going to hunt in that unit, you've got to find water. Now, don't, you know, don't go outline a bunch of water holes that are along a county road. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you've got to identify areas that are in a zone between travel corridors for traffic that you can get to the middle of an area and there's water in there, and that's going to be a remote zone that's got water. You're going to have to hit multiple water holes, and then you'll find where the animals are. Again, that and that leads into the next thing we need to talk about, which is navigating out there. You yeah, absolutely. Have, you have got to understand basic mapping and orienteering. If you don't understand it and you get out there and you're relying on your GPS and all these fancy maps and everything that are out there, that believe me, I love now. I mean, I feel like I can do anything now with the stuff that's available to us. But if you don't understand how to identify topographical features, if you don't understand how to use those topographical features to create a corridor for you to walk and know where you are, and by that I mean you've got to be able to look at a topo map and then look at your surroundings and say, okay, there's that ridge, there's that cliff face, there's the drainage with the wide water in it. So that's ahead of me. The water's ahead of me. The cliff face is on my left. The ridge is on my right. Then you can put your map up. You can put your GPS up, and you know where you're going, and you're not constantly buried your head into a GPS. What happens if you sit down to take a nap or eat lunch, and you leave your GPS on the side of a hill somewhere, which, believe it or not, happens way more than you believe, and I can tell you this, in 25 years of elk hunting, I've found two GPSs. So I believe you. Absolutely. I swear. I swear. I mean, I, I, I literally sat down one day to eat lunch and looked down, and there was a, uh, a GPS laid on the ground where I sat down. So somebody else had sat down there for lunch. So, But you've got to understand how to navigate without the electronic equipment. If you don't, you are going to be in a bind. You also need to know a little bit how to a little bit of how to navigate by the stars. And by, when I say navigate by stars, you at least need to know which stars are in which direction, which you know you know which groups of stars are in this direction. Just so when you get there, you kind of know where you are. Because if you get in a bind out there in the dark, man, that's not a situation you want to be in. So. That is very, very important, and I think that starting this at such a young age and starting it before all the technology, it probably led me to be a successful elk hunter out west, being from a, you know, from a southern state, because I had to learn to do it the hard way first. There was no other alternative. So I'll, t- I'll be honest with you, I never use a GPS out there, very rarely. If I use a GPS, it's to go back to a kill site, um, or maybe find my camp in the dark if I'm two miles from camp in the dark. Um, but very rarely do I use it. So that's an important, uh, important you know, thing to remember. Uh, another thing as far as gear, I would tell you that there's some things that are very important. The top three things to me, in the most important part of your gear, the first, the, the top three things are boots, boots, and boots. So if you don't have good, comfortable boots that are broken in before you go, broken in before you go, very well broken in, you're going to get a flat tire very quickly, and you're going to be bonked out out there and not be able to hunt. You're going to have blisters, you're going to be miserable, and you're not going to be effective. Now, one of the mistakes I made, Brandon, was I originally I went to these real heavy leather mountaineering style boots in the beginning. 
and over the last 20, 25 years, I have transitioned more into these mid-height, mid-weight, light trail boots, Gore-Tex, of course, uh, and then use gaiters. Uh, because what happens is, is the grass is wet in the morning from the dew and all that, and you don't want to be wet all day, you know, after you've started in the morning before daylight. So, but very lightweight trail style boots more than these heavy, heavy leather boots. Listen, the odds are, you know, you're not going to be out there on shale slides and climbing rock faces and all that jazz. You know, you're not going to be in those environments for the most part. So something comfortable and super light and breathable, that is way more important. Um, then with regards to, like, tents, um, cooking gear, sleeping bags, depending on where you're from and how much time you spend camping, I, I made the mistakes of going super, super light, super, super light, which is great to be super light. But it's miserable to save 10 pounds going in and be miserable for 10 days while you're there. I always take a four-season tent. They get Yes, they get a little warmer. Yes, they're just a touch heavier. You might get hot in them during the day if you're sleeping in or you're laying there midday. But the last thing you want to happen is a sleet storm, a hail storm, snow, and you have this little rinky-dink lightweight tent that's condensating on you, dripping water on you, collapsing on you, blowing around. It's not what you want. Get a little bit heavier tent and get a four-season tent. I've got the lightweight shelters, the tarps, the bivvies. I've got all that stuff. But those are the, those are the things that I use like if I've been packed in by horses and I plan on maybe doing a couple little overnight spike camps. Um, having sleeping uh, having sleeping arrangements with a floor and a totally closed protected tent is so important because uh, I don't want animals in the tent with me at night. I'm not worried about bears and stuff. I'm worried about skunks, porcupines, um, giant rats. Some places have these colossal rats. Mice. I don't want all that in there with me. <laughs> I want to be by myself. Um, the rule with tents is if it says four-man tent, it's three. If it's three, it's two. If it's two, it's one. If it says a one-man tent, it's made for a child. So that's very important. If you're going to have a tent, you're going to sleep in by yourself, get a two-man tent. Uh, sleeping bag, if you're from the south or from the east, I go heavier on the sleeping bags. Like I'll get a zero-degree bag instead of a 30-degree bag, even though I know it's only going to get down to maybe 30 because I don't, I don't handle the cold as well as the guys do out there. And you also want a bag that and a shelter that is windproof because the wind is what cuts you down out there. It's not necessarily the temperatures. Um, cooking stoves, man, just make sure to get a quality stove that you can test, that you've used at your house, and you, I mean, cook a dinner with it for your kids and your family. Make sure you know how to use it. Make sure you've, you've used it outside in the wind and see how long it'll burn on a tank. Because you don't want to get out there and have a stove that won't work in the wind or you can't figure out how to use or burns through fuel so fast you run out of fuel halfway through the trip. That's a disaster. <laughs> so, um, and then water, water is key for us as well. Um, I've got the gravity style filtration systems and the pump style filtration systems. I take them both. I also take the tablets in case I run out and I just want to scoop up some water, dump it in my bottle and let it cure. Um, the gravity things are great. They clog up a little bit, but for a one week or 10 day hunt, they're going to work fine. And then you can clean them out when you get home. Um, and you can do large volumes of water at camp and then just fill your bladder or your bottle as you go out. But you're going to want to take way more water with you on a hunt than you think you're going to need. You're going to burn through it so fast in those altitudes. And I've gotten myself in trouble not having enough water. Um, yeah, that's a scary thing right there. 
It is. It is. I, I um, I, I ran out in Colorado about four years ago and still had about three miles to go. And past some water that I considered dipping my face in, I was in that bad of shape. Uh, but but held out and got to camp. But but it, it is so critical, so critical. The other thing that people need to think about out there is bugs. No one thinks about mosquitoes or anything like that when they're thinking about going out west. Well, they got them too. And based on moisture and temperature, you could have a horrendous experience with bugs if you're not prepared. You know, I I use a a really cool head net that's made for fly fishing that actually tucks in under your shirt, under your shoulders. Um, And I also, you know, I don't like using the chemicals or the sprays. Uh, And I also make sure that my tent seals completely up so it does not let insects in. Very, very important. Um, Let's see. What else, Brandon? What else do we need to talk about? Uh, Anything like any particular thing you would say, Brian, as far as, uh, like, lighting? Like, is there a certain type of flashlight that obviously waits something you always yeah. consider batteries are heavy well uh, all right so let me back let me just talk about lighting a little bit led all the way everything led i try to get everything to use double a batteries and the reason is is that i have to carry double a batteries for camera gear microphones because we're filming um and if everyone in camp has the same light that uses the same battery, or at least a, a light that uses the same battery for your headlamps, your camp lights, whatever. If everything uses the same batteries, no one's ever going to be in a bind and not be able to, you know, power up their equipment. We have chargers that we take uh, that work off of double A's for charging phones, things like that, GPSs. So being universal with what all your equipment uses with one style of battery is a big leg up. But, man, spend the money and buy a badass headlamp. Get a headlamp, a a nice LED headlamp that works, that's going to be reliable. Get one that has an extra bulb that you can change out. It should, for some reason, that, you know, the the little bulb element goes out in it. but make sure you've got a good one because the last thing you want to do is be walking back from a hunt to your camp in the dark with a crappy light. It is horrible because it's tough terrain, it's difficult terrain, and you can walk off a trail in five seconds flat and be 100 yards off the trail and you might as well be two miles off of it. So, you know, that's money well spent there. So... Clothing-wise, Brandon, this is important. You don't need to take a bunch of clothes with you. You're going to basically wear like a 7- to 10-day hunt. I'll probably wear, I'll take two lightweight pair of Sitka pants. I'll take two lightweight, like, liners or shirts, um, you know, like layering shirts, base layers. Um, I'll take basically one jacket i'll take one insulating layer and that's it um and then i'll have an ultra light rainproof system some type of ultra light packable you know rain rain suit you know um sitka has a really lightweight um uh packable rain uh, system top and bottom that i just pack up and it literally packs down to where I can put it in a side pocket of my pack. Um, and that's it for clothes. You don't need to take a bunch of clothes in. I take two pair of socks. I'm swapping the socks out daily and letting the other pair air out. And um, that's it. A lot of people take too much clothes, and you're not going to spend, you're not going to want to carry that weight in, and you're not going to be changing clothes that much. Um, the other thing is, is that I stay by the fire at night, I let my clothes get smoky because I would rather the animals smell wood smoke than a stinky hunter because you will stink. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. Um, and then the other life-saving 
thing that I take and have taken for years is wet wipes, unscented wet wipes. And I'm not going to go into details with that, but make sure you got plenty and take plenty with you because you will use them for everything, everything. And they will make you feel like you're a human seven days into a 10-day hunt. Well, I'm sure they have multiple uses for sure. They do. They do. Uh, well, one thing. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Well, I, I know we're getting short on time, but I would say this too. Getting an animal down, this is very important. I take Tyvek, pieces of Tyvek. You know what Tyvek is? House no, wrap. Don't. It's house wrap. It's what people wrap houses with before they put siding on or brick. You know, it's the, the vapor berry that goes around the house. Okay. I I cut pieces of Tyvek, fold them up. They're super light. They weigh nothing. They're waterproof. You can fold that Tyvek up into little packages, put them in Ziploc bags, stuff them all through your pack. I carry tons of 10 by 10 pieces of Tyvek. I put them under my tent. I put them outside my tent, sit gear on. I take them in my pack. I can use it as an sh- emergency shelter if I have to with cord. So many uses for it. But should you get an animal down, you need some type of light other than your headlamp that you can hang up above you to light that area, okay? You need good game bags that breathe. Don't take trash bags and put meat in trash bags. Disaster. Complete and utter disaster. Knives. You need one good knife that is easy to sharpen, you know, a a fixed blade knife that's easy to sharpen, for working on bone, separating ball joints, things of that. And then other than that, you need a Havilon or something like that with interchangeable blades. Get the heavier blades because you'll snap them on the hide. You will go through a dozen blades quartering up an elk. Um, so you've got to have an interchangeable blade knife. You can't, and, and this still will, will date, date me, of course, but... I used to take box blades, box cutters, and carpet knives out west with me 25 years ago before the days of interchangeable knives because I never could keep a knife sharp trying to quarter an animal that's got high and half-inch thick. So that is super, super important. You lay your Tyvek out, keep your meat clean. There is no reason to gut an elk. I know all us whitetail guys, we gut everything. No reason to gut an elk. You can even get the tenderloins out after you get the back straps and the quarters off. You can get the tenderloins out easy as pie without gutting an elk. Don't gut them. Go side by side, skin them, lay the hide over, use that hide to set the meat on. You got a good clean surface there. And then get them in the game bags and get them elevated to where you can get them cool, 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 and cool fast. Don't hang your meat where the sun's going to hit the next day. Hang it in shady, dark timbers, air, dark timber areas. It's got to be cool. Last resort, if you're stuck back there and it's 80-plus degrees, which it happens during bow season all the time, you can put that meat in the water. I don't recommend it. I don't like to do it, but you can do it. You can set it in creeks and cool it down, but and, you're, and your meat's going to be okay, but you just run a risk of bacteria forming, okay? So, but it's better than letting it get hot and spoil. Um, golly, it's hard to cram all this into this in a short time. <laughs> so, oh, I know there's um, a lot. There's a lot, but that is important. Meat care is a lot. Getting it off the body as fast as you can. Getting it cool as fast as you can. That Tyvek will. You won't believe how many uses you'll have for those little that little lightweight pieces of Tyvek. You can set set it out, put all your meat on it, you know, all your your drop pieces, your cut pieces. If you're if you're going to be packing it out on your back like what we do, do not try to overload your pack and put it all in, and you and your partner partner split it and carry it in one trip. If you are not Cameron Haynes or Aaron Snyder, you know it, it is hard, hard, hard. Your hip flexors will just bonk on you so fast if you overload, your legs will bonk out on you. If you pull 
muscles in your legs, tear your quads or something like that, then what are you going to do? It's better yeah, to you're take two trips. Yo, you're in big trouble. Then you got to look at your partner and go, okay, can you carry all my elk out for me? Which is not fair to him. It's not, you know, it's just not what you want to happen. So right. divide it up, keep your weights light, carry them out, make sure you can get it out, and, you know, at least get one load out and see how you do before you take your last load out. And it may be three trips. Don't be afraid to take multiple trips. That's where the everybody messes up that comes out there, Brandon. They read all this stuff, and they listen to these guys that hunt out west, that live out west. These guys are going out every weekend hiking through these mountains, carrying weight. We're not. There's nothing you can do where we live to prepare for those elevations and that and that thin air. And for me, where I live, it's Pancake Flat. I have to go to my son's high school stadium, and I have to march stairs. I have to go up and down those stadium stairs, you know, as long as I can, or either the stairs at my house. That's the only thing that you have to use is stairs. Now, different parts of the country, they have, you know, great hills and, you know, good topography where they can train. Running is great, but putting a pack on your back and climbing hills, that's 99.9% what you need to do. That's it. Yeah, that's good advice. I mean, you got to do something, and you should definitely do it with your pack that you're going to be using. And preferably, and your, and your boots. Be a way you break yeah, break in your boots that way as well. That's right. That's right. And food, I'll tell you this real quick. Mountain house meals, I'm probably going to get sued over this, but mountain house meals are terrible for you. They're terrible for you. There are companies that make freeze-dried food or dehydrated, it's dehydrated food, I'm sorry, not freeze-dried, mountain houses are freeze-dried, dehydrated food packages. That's what you want to get, and you want to get the ones that are healthy, they're high in fat. You, you need those things for your body to work. Um, you need, you know, you can't crunch granola bars all day. I mean, they're going to give you energy and all that stuff, but you need fats and proteins and things like that, too. You wouldn't believe how fast you'll get depleted out there. So you've got to go out and research these the hydrated meals that you can buy that have all those high protein and fat contents in them, as well as the carbs and things that you need. I take Snicker bars with me um, just for energy. Um, I take um, I do take, like, protein bars and all. I take oatmeal. Uh, it's light. It's easy to make. You can actually take little packages of brown sugar, you know, and uh, and sprinkle it in there and have a pretty good meal. You can mix it with water, and you're good to go. I also take, like, protein powders, like, you know, some of this stuff that's out there, like Mountain Ops and Wilderness Athlete and all. They have these great protein powders and supplements and things. I take little Ziploc bags of those, and I mix that stuff in with my meals, and I mix it in with, like, my oatmeal or grits. I know you guys don't know what a grit is, but we eat grits. Um, I do, I mix I do sadly. I know what a grit is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mix all that in with it, too. And so every meal that you make, take the opportunity to provide, you know, uh, fuel and energy and protein to survive, you know, to serve for your body to, to survive and thrive in an in a element, in an environment that it's not used to having to, you know, be productive in. So that's my food tip. Um, I'll tell you this. Find somewhere that has fish. Hunt somewhere that has trout and take you a little packable rod or at least a string that you can do, take a willow branch or something and take like little salmon eggs or, or a Ziploc bag of corn niblets. And, man, if you can get you a little fishing license and hunt somewhere where there's trout, man, we eat trout just about every night when we're out there, if we're hunting near somewhere that has trout in a little stream. And then um, definitely get a small game license because I'll tell you this, if there's a grouse at 20 yards and an elk at 40, 
it's a 50-50 chance the grouse is probably going to get shot. I love eating those grouse. <laughs> so, uh, and that's a great source of protein while you're out there, and they're easy to cook over a fire. Um, and take some seasoning with you in a Ziploc bag that you can sprinkle on the trout, you know, or, or a grouse or something like that. There's plenty of opportunities out there. So, um, so that that's that's my food spiel. That's a that's a a bunch of great info and it's a bunch of stuff that I hadn't heard before. And by all means, Brian, you're not the first guy to kind of say Mountain House sucks because I've heard it a hundred times on on uh, Western podcasts. So it definitely isn't good for you. I've, I know that. No, and there's only a few of them that taste decent. You know. I don't know. I've never ate one, but I don't hear anybody say they like them. So we'll leave it at that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, but that is the condensed version of of what to do, how to do it. I know I've left a million things out, but I guess I would just leave it with don't be intimidated. It is not that hard. Um, it's a, It's an easy, economical way to hunt out west every year. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. You're going to meet people out there. You're going to meet locals. You're going to meet people from other states. And hunters share. They may not share on the Internet. They may not share on podcasts. Of course, you didn't hear me say any units, but (laughs) they may not share that. But when you're out there in the field and you run into other hunters or you're in town or you're fueling up or taking an elk in to get cut up, you're going to meet people and you're going to learn areas. You're going to learn more. You're You're going to network. And it's just going to expand from there, and you're going to have opportunities at elk every time you go out there. It's not that hard. That's uh, that's what I like to hear, and that is a lot of truth to that too. And uh, you know, it's just exciting to you know even talk with you, Brian, about this because you've developed a niche that you you've made perfect for you, and it's a niche that in every aspect you've figured out how to make the hunt more enjoyable, and that's what it should be. And, uh, I mean, me just listening to you, I'm like, man, that makes so much sense, and there's so much stuff that can be done just to to have a good time and kind of debunk those fears and, and enjoy yourself while you're on the mountain. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I know we're way over on time. I'm going to tell you one story. The very first day, that I ever went elk hunting out west in New Mexico, I hiked up to a meadow that I'd found on my topo map. I walked it a mile and a half from camp up to the meadow. The meadow was full of elk, Brandon. And I know now that I didn't know then that the herd bull in there was a 370 to 380 class bull. <clears throat> and the elk were moving right up the tree line my direction. <clears throat> I checked the wind. The wind was right. I backed up. They came right down the edge of the meadow, right in front of me. And right before I got ready to draw, I heard a noise behind me. I thought, oh, my gosh, they circled around. I turned around and looked, and there was a hunter standing there. He had heard this bull bugling. He saw me, waved, backed up, and squatted down behind a tree, got a cow call out, and cow called for me and called that bull up to 50 yards, and I was hunting with a compound then. I shot at that elk. I shot him for 30 yards. He was so big, and it was so wide open, he looked like he was in my face. I shot him for 30 yards. I misjudged the yardage by 20 yards. I shot three shots at this bull while he stood there and looked at me. And then he finally ran off after the third shot. The guy walked up to me and said, that was a world-class elk that you just missed three times. I've never seen any, a bull stand there and watch somebody shoot at it. We walk out in the meadow, and all three of my arrows, you could put one hand around. I shot a perfect group. It was just 20 yards short. But I sat up there on that meadow with that gentleman. He was from New Mexico, and he talked with me for two to three hours while we sat down and ate. And he gave me a crash course on elk cutting, where to hunt, where to go, how to do it, what to look for. That's the type of networking I'm talking about. That's the type of 
generosity that hunters share with each other. Most hunters do. You're going to experience that out there. That was my first day of my first hunt, and I sat down with a guy who's probably in his 60s and got a Ph.D. version of what to do, how to do it, and where to do it in that unit. And never saw the guy again, don't even know his name, but that's the type of thing that can happen out there. And I was not successful that hunt, but the very next year I went back, I killed a 280-inch bull out there on my own, 20 years old, based on where that guy told me to go and how to hunt. So there you go. There's my there's my one hunting story. <laughs> that, that is cool, though, it's nice to share those stories about good sportsmanship and camaraderie and, and just good people. That's pretty neat. It is. It is. It is. So anyway, there you go. But thanks, Brian, for, you know, taking the time to educate us and conversate with us. And, and and all of us can definitely take stuff from all those little niches of of perfection that you've, you've customized for, you know, doing do-it-yourself elk hunting out west. I think it's awesome. And uh, I can't wait for the fall, man. I can't wait for us to go chase them. I can't either, buddy. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Absolutely. And guys, as you know, if you're downloading this show from a mobile device, make sure you take the time, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in, just leave us a review. It's a huge help to get the show out to others. And we'll see you guys down the trail next week.